Hi guys, how's everyone doing? I hope everyone's staying safe from all the storms that have been rolling in here lately. We've been getting quite a few here in Indiana, so it's been interesting. But I wanted to update you guys because I did last episode, I said I would do a little research and let you know what I found out regarding Regarding when the MRI and the CAT scan machines were um, fully in use. So I wanted to keep my promise and I did that. And so the first clinical use of the CAT scan was in 1971. And it was created by Sir Godfrey Hounsfield. Hope I said that right. And the MRI technology was patented in 1972 by Raymond Damadian. So, I was correct. Um, they did not have MRI machines and CAT scans to check the prisoners out in the 1950s. So, there's that. But, with that being said... I really, really enjoyed doing the research on Polly Bartlett and Wyoming's first serial killer. So, I decided to do a little series within this show. And it is currently going to be the first serial killer of each state. And today, we're going to talk about the first serial killer of Nebraska. Warning. The following story describes scenes of murder, some of which involve children. Viewer discretion is advised. Stephen D. Richards was born in Wheeling, West Virginia on March 18, 1856. He had five sisters and one brother and when he was about six years old his family moved to Ohio and they moved around a lot but they eventually settled in Mount Pleasant Ohio when he was around 11 on September 16th 1871 his mother passed away of unknown causes five years later he met a young lady named Anna Milhorn and they got engaged and they would regularly correspond during his travels shortly after. In 1876, shortly after his engagement, he headed out west as was usual for the time and he found work at the Iowa Lunatic Asylum in Mount Pleasant, Iowa as a grave digger. And then later stated that his lack of empathy was caused by this specific job. When he left this job, he went to Kansas City and stayed there for a little while. And then he moved to Nebraska. And while he was traveling to Nebraska, he met up with a man and they decided they were going to travel together. And after setting up camp for the night... They started playing cards and gambling. Richards was winning the majority of the money. So the next day, the stranger pulled a gun and demanded his money back. So Richards shot him in the head and then dumped his body in the Platte River. That was, that was his first murder. A short time later, he came across another man about 15 miles from a place called Walker's Ranch. This man remembered seeing him with the other man and started asking where he was at. During their conversation, Richards discovered this man and the stranger were friends and business partners. He denied any acknowledgement of this guy, but 
the other man would not let it go. So, Richards killed him as well. Then he sold his horse in a nearby town. Before heading on to Kearney, Nebraska, he stopped at the home of a man named Jasper Harlson, who was a train robber, supposedly. And Jasper wasn't home, but his wife Mary and their three children were. Mary noticed that Richard's shirt was stained with blood, and she asked about it. He didn't even know there was blood on his shirt, and jokingly, he said, it must have been from those men he murdered. Well, as you can expect, that ended their conversation right there, and he went on about his merry way. He then traveled to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, using counterfeit funds, bought a horse and buggy. The seller found out the bills were fake, tracked him down, and demanded he pay with real money or return the horse and buggy. Well, Richards refused to do either one of those, so he threatened to have him arrested. So Richards shot him, buried him, and then just rode away into the sunset. In March 1877, he and another young man left Grand Island, Nebraska on horseback, heading back toward Kearney. They stopped to camp between Lowell and Kearney along the Platte River. Richards woke up at around 3 a.m. and he woke his partner up, telling him it was almost morning and they needed to get moving. Well, apparently his, his friend wasn't ready to get up and he was quite mad, so they started arguing. And that argument ended with Richards shooting him in the head. They never say what he did with his body, but I'm going to say he just left him, according to what happens next. He goes to Kearney and then registers under the name F.A. Hodge or Hogue, H-O-G-E. If anybody knows the pronunciation, please let me know. That was the uh, name he registered at the hotel under. Um, and this is where he would reunite with some old friends named George Dutch Henry Johnson and his companion, Hurst, as well as a man by the name of Mr. Burns. On March 21st, Richards and Burns were arrested. They were never Im immediately told why they were under arrest, but Richards assumed it was because he had murdered his previous companion. They were later notified that it was for the murder of a Peter Getway, but both men were acquitted due to lack of evidence. But in June of 1878, he was arrested yet again for larceny. And in case you're wondering, because I was, larceny is theft of personal property that can basically just be carried off. And he claimed the charge was unfounded. However, during this time, he was reunited with Miss Mary Harlson, who was in jail for allegedly aiding her husband and another prisoner in escaping the Kearney jail. Now, she supposedly agreed to sell him the deed to their farm for $600 in six months' time. Now, at that time, $600 was equal to $17,779 nowadays. So, that's a nice chunk of money. After he was released, he traveled around Nebraska for a while, and then he headed back to the Harleston, Harleston Farm in Kearney on October 18th. 1878. As soon as he got there, she transferred the property to him. But he apparently stayed for several weeks and even reportedly married Mary on November 2nd, 1878. Now, some believe that was just to get the property a lot easier. Supposedly, she found out about his murderous ways. 
and she was quite the gossiper. So he was afraid she would tell somebody. On November 3rd, 1878, he got up early along with a man named Brown who was staying on the farm and had been helping her out with the work that needed to be done there. He found a spade or a shovel and dug a hole. He then went back in the house and killed Mary, 10-year-old Daisy, 4-year-old Mabel, and 2-year-old Jasper with an axe. He then cleaned the blood off himself and the floor before sitting down to breakfast. After he ate, he carried the bodies outside and buried them in the hole that was nearby the house. When people would ask where the, the family had went, he would simply just state, they left with Brown. And he had no idea where they went or when they would return. Their bodies were found on December 11th, 1878. According to some reports, they were not buried at all, but placed under a haystack. On December 9th, 1878, he agreed to help a neighbor named Peter Anderson, who was an immigrant from Sweden, with some work on his own property. And Anderson became ill shortly after eating a meal that Richards had prepared which caused him to suspect Richards had poisoned him. He believed it so much, he told a neighbor his suspicions. And then the next day, he confronted Richards. They fought, and then Richards beat Anderson to death with a hammer. Or a hatchet. Or he shot him. At the time, it was up in the air. At this point, Richards decided it was just best for him to leave Kearney because he figured the bodies were going to be found pretty soon. So that evening, while he was hitching up Anderson's horses and preparing to leave, some neighbors came by asking about Anderson. He told them he was in the house. While they were walking in the house, he then took one of the horses and just left. Anderson's body was discovered in the cellar under a pile of coal. Richards denied ever poisoning him because he said that just wasn't his style. Anderson was later buried at the Bethany Cemetery in Axtell, Nebraska. So at this point, Richards knows he's in a whole world of trouble. So he made his way back east. Eventually, he met up with Jasper Harrelson and the other prisoner that had broken out of the Kearney Jail. They traveled together for a while through Wheeling, West Virginia, and on into Ohio. I can't help but wonder... Did he tell Jasper about his wife and kids? Did Jasper even care? I have questions, and I don't have any answers. And that bothers me. By the time Richards got back to Mount Pleasant, Ohio, on December 16, 1878, he was a wanted man with a $200 bounty on his head, courtesy of the Nebraska governor. Around December 20th, 1878, he attended a ballroom dance with two unknown women. Constable McGrew recognized him from his wanted posters and enlisted the help of a prison guard to capture him. Now, according to Richards, he only surrendered because the women he was with refused to leave him. He stated if he had escaped... He would have made his way back to Nebraska because no one would ever expect him to go back. While jailed in Steubenville, Ohio, he wrote two articles for local papers detailing nine murders over a three-year span.
during his return to Nebraska, Sheriff David Anderson of Buffalo County and Sheriff Martin of Kearney County, Nebraska, decided not to take him through the towns that he had committed these murders in or near due to the public outrage and they were afraid he would be lynched. However, law enforcement was able to link him to the nine murders he admitted to. But they also believed that there are more. On December 28th, 1878, he was moved to a jail in Omaha, then transferred to Kearney by train. On December 30th, 1878, a large crowd of angry townsfolk gathered outside the Kearney Jail. And fearing a lynching, the guards took extra precautions to protect themselves and Richards. Mostly themselves. Richards' trial began January 1st, 1879 in Minden, Nebraska, with Judge William Gaslin presiding. Richards pled not guilty to Anderson's murder, stating it was self-defense and justifiable. Prosecution only called seven witnesses to the stand. Richards also gave testimony. He claimed he killed Anderson with a hammer after he reached for a hatchet, even though he repeatedly asked him not to reach for a weapon. After only two hours of deliberation, the jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death by hanging. His execution was scheduled for April 26, 1879. Spectators during the trial said he was cheerful and indifferent during the proceedings and even during his conviction. They decided his execution would be a public event despite Sheriff Martin being concerned about the crowds becoming violent. For this reason, they constructed a barrier around the gallows to separate the crowd from Richards. However, tickets were sold for access to the restricted area. Richards himself was also allowed to invite guests and he decided to invite some friends he had made that were members of the press. Can you imagine inviting people to your execution? That's... How, how would you do that? <laughs> Sorry, my mind wandered. <laughs> At 1 p.m. on April 26, 1879... He was led to the gallows by the sheriff and a guard. He then began an impassioned defense of his actions, claiming Anderson's death to be self-defense and denying any involvement in the Harlson family murders. He then stated he had found the Lord and had made peace with God. Then he asked the crowd to join him in singing the hymn Come thou fount of every blessing. His final words were, Jesus be with me now. Reverend W. Sanford G., who presided over the execution, stated to the press that he hoped his profession of religious salvation was genuine, but it was a very good possibility that it wasn't. At 1.17 p.m., he was hanged. According to the St. Louis Globe, it took 15 minutes for him to die. He was the first person in Nebraska to be executed since its incorporation to the U.S. in 1867. He was also Nebraska's first documented serial killer. He was buried in Minden, but his body was stolen the night after the execution even though his grave was guarded. It was believed a few doctors who had wanted him to donate his body to science were the ones who stole it. It was returned a short time later. However, 
he was dug up again. And this time, his bones were scattered through the streets of Kearney while his head was displayed in a window of the local newspaper office. The current whereabouts of his body or the head are unknown. At the time of his execution, it was believed criminals were limited in education and were of poor quality, meaning they really didn't have much else going for them, so they turned to lives of crime. Richards did not fit the public's idea of a hardened criminal or a murderer. He was charismatic, handsome, well-educated, and outspoken. In 2018, he was described as the Old West's Ted Bundy, even though he seemed to be more of a thrill killer and an opportunist. Criminal psychology and profiling would not be used for nine more years when Jack the Ripper would emerge in 1888. So what do you guys think? Do you guys think he was a thrill killer? Do you think that some of these murders were done in self-defense? Am I the only person that wants to know if Jasper Harlson knew or even cared his family was gone? And where where did his head go? <laughs> but where where are his bones? I, th- these are questions that keep me up at night, people. <laughs> this, this is this is how my my brain works, and and these these are these are things that I want to know, and I'll probably never know. So the podcast is available on all platforms now, or at least it should be. If it's not, please please let me know so I can make it available. Also, you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at True Crime and Whatnot Podcast. Please make sure you like, share, subscribe, rate. I know you can do that on Spotify. But until next time, stay true and whatnot. Later. Later.